thank you for doing this. Uh, at Unger, leaders of the US and China each issued a diplomatic opening to cooperate and yes. touted the importance of diplomacy over militarism. Does that signal possibly that both sides are trying to calm the waters after the UNSC saying that growing confrontation risked a new Cold War if the two superpowers are unable to find common ground? Can I just <coughs> add to that for a second? Yes. You, you also mentioned the New York about US China relations, the need for competition not to tip into conflict. Does that also figure in your discussions in DC? And how, how cognizant was everybody about this? Well, actually, it was President Biden has said, we can be very careful not to allow this competition to tip into conflict or into a, you know, adversarial relationship. And similarly, President Xi, uh, I think, re-emphasized the point that it should not be a zero-sum game and one doesn't have to achieve success at the expense of the other. So I think, based on what the two leaders have said in New York and as well as my last few days down here uh, interacting with Secretary of State uh, Lincoln, uh, Kurt Campbell, leaders of both parties on Capitol Hill. I would put it to you this way. First, there's no doubt that there is bipartisan concern, anxiety even, about China and how it's rise affects the strategic balance and the impact of China on the United States. There's no question, both parties very concerned, and in some cases, even anxious about that. That's the first point. But the second point is I also get a clear signal that both sides, and certainly on the American side of the house, both parties actually want to avoid the collision. I think everyone is painfully aware of the enormous consequences if a collision, either by design or unwittingly by accident, uh, occurs. So that's the second point. The third point I would make is one from a Southeast Asian perspective, because clearly that was why I was here. Uh, to give them an, a, a view from Southeast Asia. And, and the one point which I made in all my interactions was that as far as Southeast Asia is concerned, we recognize that the stakes are very high. The dynamics of the US-China relationship uh, have got enormous consequences on us. But Southeast Asia does not want to become a token or a lever or an arena for proxy contests between the, su the two superpowers. Southeast Asia and Singapore wants to be taken on our own right, meaning that in Southeast Asia we have 650 million people. We have a combined GDP of $2.8 trillion, which by the way will double and then subsequently quadruple in the next two decades. The United States is the largest investor in Southeast Asia and has more invested in Southeast Asia than it has invested in India, China, Japan and even Korea combined. In other words, America has skin in the game. On the other side of the ledger, China is the biggest trading partner for virtually all of us in Southeast Asia. But if you ask the Chinese, the largest trading partner for China is now ASEAN, Southeast Asia. So the point I was trying to make was that there's a lot going on in Southeast Asia. There, is, there are great opportunities emerging in the next two decades. Take Southeast Asia seriously on our own merits and not just look at us in terms of the great big power uh, competition. And I think I succeeded in making this point or I will continue to emphasize uh, making this point. Then the next question is, having made the argument for why the United States should engage Southeast Asia on our own merits, then what are the specific fields they should look at? I reiterated the point that in Southeast Asia, trade and investment are strategy. That's really what 
the 10 of us in Southeast Asia are looking for, meaning who's going to trade with us, who's going to invest in us, how can we get mutually beneficial economic relationships. And it is economics that drives the strategy. I think my uh, interlocutors accept that argument. Um, clearly, one interesting missing piece of the jigsaw is the CPTPP. You know, it began as a you know, multilateral free trade agreement between four small countries, Singapore, Brunei, New Zealand, and Chile. And then the United States got interested, Japan came in, and it became the full TPP with 12 partners. Unfortunately, due to political reasons domestically, and also I think there's a certain zeitgeist against free trade and globalization and the competition that brings. But whatever the cause, you realize that certainly within America, there was no appetite to proceed with the TPP. Fortunately, Japan and the other 11 members decided to proceed anyway. We renamed it the CPTPP. But really, think of this as a skyscraper built. Uh, to a large extent, if you look carefully at the details in terms of intellectual property protection, in terms of labour protection, in terms of environment protection, this would have been the most high standard, ambitious, multilateral free trade agreement in recent memory. Anyway, the United States could not proceed. But now, just within the last two weeks, it is China that has come knocking at the door. And in fact, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi told me just a couple of days before the formal announcement that China felt that this was an avenue worth pursuing, indicated that they would pursue it and actually apply to become part of the CPTPP. And of course, China wasn't the first. I mean, the UK has already put up its hand even earlier on. And then, of course, later on, Taiwan as well. So the point now is that there is this big piece of the jigsaw, which is an icon of economic integration, trade, investment across the Pacific. And the United States will have to decide its role in this. It's ironic that having been there at the creation and having substantially negotiated a very ambitious free trade agreement, if the United States will subsequently not have any role at all in the emerging economic architecture in Southeast Asia. So um, I don't think the political zeitgeist in America is right for it yet. But nevertheless, this is a strategic point that needs further debate and discussion down here. I think the fact that Amer the Congress is looking at the infrastructure bill uh, and other investments both in terms of hardware and software within America. Well, if they can settle this within the next couple of weeks or months, uh, and you see a more confident, cohesive America, maybe that might provide opportunities for America to do something in the economic space. Anyway, so that took, uh, that was a substantial part of our conversations on the Hill uh, with both parties. The other uh, emerging field is in the digital field. Again, China has noticed that Singapore has negotiated a digital economy partnership with Chile and New Zealand. In fact, we're also negotiating with Australia, we're discussing it with the UK and other partners. And China has also expressed interest in this new emerging area of the digital economy. Again, this is something which America ought to be interested in. Uh, it may be politically more doable, because in a sense it's a more circumscribed area, but nevertheless an emerging area with great uh, importance. So we'll see how this goes, but it was useful for me to be able to put this on the table and say, guys, look at it, consider what else we can do. And then of course, there's uh, the green agenda sustainable economy, dealing with climate change. 
And this is something which uh, between America and Singapore, first on a bilateral level, you know, we are keen on doing, on pursuing this, but even on a regional level, I think green agreements, which would facilitate investments in the renewable energy, in energy conservation, energy efficiency, and the technologies of the future, again, is another area ripe for exploration. And then, of course, there were discussions on the pandemic, and in particular, the need not only to produce and distribute vaccines widely across Southeast Asia, but also the need to have resilient, reliable supply chains. So again, as you can see, so that there was quite a lot of uh, substantive uh, issues that we were able to discuss on a strategic scale. But uh, you know, the, the short summary of it is their concern about China, but we pointed out that Southeast Asia is worth investing and looking at in our own right. And there are many areas uh, involving trade, investment, digital economy, green economy, uh, pandemic preparation, and uh, supply chains. Uh, and much work lies ahead of all of us. So we'll see where this goes. Watch this space. U.S. Uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken has told ASEAN foreign ministers yes. that Washington will soon release a new comprehensive strategy for the yes. wider Indo-Pacific. Yes. The Biden administration hopes to focus on its main national security priority of countering a rising China. Washington wants to build on a shared vision for a free, open, interconnected, resilient and secure region. What do you think this could entail and what role can Singapore play in that? Well, as I said, you know, we are transiting into a multipolar world. So every power, big or middle, has its own preferred architecture or orientation. But really, for the future, these things need to be negotiated, need to be discussed. And the key point I was making is that Southeast Asia is not just an item on the menu. We want to be at the table, we want to discuss, we want to help shape the agenda. And in the case of Southeast Asia, we do not want a collision. Uh, we do not want to be forced to take sides. But depending on the issue, we may have to take positions. So this is a, an area that needs far more thought, candid, open discussions, and uh, I think I've had lots of that the last three days. You have one more question? Yeah, one more question. Thank yes. you. Uh, last one from me. Singapore has been a steadfast supporter of the US in the Asia Pacific for the past 55 years. You recently said Singapore is in uncharted territory with the rise of China, even as the US remains a leading superpower. You added that there are new challenges as well as much opportunity. Do you think Singaporeans can understand the, quote, geostrategic forces that are playing out? Can they rise up to the challenges and grab opportunities? Well, the short answer is yes. I think Singaporeans do appreciate the delicacy of the moment, the enormity of the stakes. Um, but if you just take a step back, if you look, look, we've only been independent for 56 years. If you look at our, the way we transformed ourselves from an entrepreneur into an advanced manufacturing site, into a key node in a global economy with multinationals, with access to technology, access to new markets, and the confidence of a Singaporean citizenry who were prepared to compete, compete head on, on the basis, basis of education, organisation, or what Mr Lee Kuan Yew described as a hard-working and disciplined people. And America's role in this, for the, since the end of the Second World War, America has stood for rules-based world order, has stood for economic integration, has promoted investments, trade, and this has been a recipe for peace and prosperity. Singapore has been a major beneficiary of this. But that same formula 
In particular, in the last 40 years, when China reformed and opened up, in fact, the biggest beneficiary of this system uh, has been China. And therefore, the biggest strategic change is the rise of China, to the point where it is now a peer strategic collaborator and competitor and rival with the United States. In that sense, this is uncharted because this has not happened in recent history. And certainly, America has never faced a rival on this order of magnitude and sophistication. Now, if that's not enough, you have another revolution in play, and that is the digital revolution. And that is disrupting jobs, wages, it's causing anxiety throughout society, and in particular even in the middle classes, because people worry, what's going to happen to my job? Um, am I going to be replaced? either by competition or by technology. And therefore, you, know, you, 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 you see this pushback, in fact, all over the world, including in Singapore, that some people feel, well, maybe if you erect walls, erect tariff barriers, you keep foreigners out, somehow you will be shielded from competition. I don't believe this. Singapore can't afford to believe this. Singapore, in fact, needs to double down to prepare for the jobs of the future and how we can remake and reskill and re uplift our people to go after the jobs and the opportunities of the future. So, you see, we're dealing with both a geostrategic rebalancing and we're dealing with a digital revolution. And then, if that's not enough, we've also got the looming threat of climate change. And this COVID pandemic has in fact been another acute reminder that there are many areas which I would define as within the global commons, that if the world is unable to work collectively together, it will be a dangerous, difficult world for all of us. So that's what I mean by the fact that uh, we are in unprecedented you know, territory, uh, we have both great dangers and great opportunities. But just imagine for a moment that the world does come together and we are able to cooperate multilaterally and we are able to deal with COVID, with vaccination, with supply chains, dealing with emerging threats. Imagine that we can get together and actually just harness the technology which is already available to deal with the threat of climate change and droughts and floods and the impact on food supply. Imagine that we can have a world where we prepare our people for the jobs of the future, where people can be confident that we can make this transition. It will also be a world where we will have to have more secure social safety nets because in this transition, there will be disruptions and there will be pain felt by some sectors of our society and we, we can't leave people behind, we've got to reach out to them. But my point is, supposing we did all that, uh, the optimist in me believes there is a real prospect for a golden age ahead of us. And little Singapore, because of the way we are, uh, the fact that we in some senses, don't have that many strategic choices, so we, have, you know, so we have to think quickly, carefully, and be a constructive player. Uh, this will also give us, I think, great opportunities, even for a tiny city-state like Singapore. So, so I, I still end on a note of optimism. Now, yes. on, on Monday, Secretary Blinken mentioned that you had both discussed Myanmar. Uh, yes, we did. What is the thinking um, you know, Singapore as well as US all the way forward for Bo Myanmar? Well, both Secretary Blinken and I are deeply concerned and anxious. The plight of the people of Myanmar. I mean, they were already challenged economically 
the pandemic pushed the economy down even further. The levels of poverty have risen. And then the political instability that came about because of the coup and the violence that that has generated. So we are all deeply concerned for the plight of our brothers and sisters in Myanmar. We still believe, and I would, I would include the we to, say, to include the United States, that ultimately the solution lies within Myanmar itself. The people, the leaders, and the leaders across the entire political spectrum need to get to sit down, negotiate, discuss in good faith for the sake of the future. We can't force this, but we can try to encourage, we can try to cajole, we can try in, in our own ways you know, to nudge them in that direction. So far, I must say, unfortunately, I don't see any sign of that. I hope I'm wrong, and I hope that they are actually having discussions. ASEAN is obviously trying to help. Uh, we are waiting for our special envoy, Dr. Erwan, to be given access to all parties and for him to be able to help facilitate these discussions. So uh, I'm afraid, you know, there are no quick and easy solutions, but to the maximum extent possible where we can help, we can help. So for instance, right now, in response to the humanitarian crisis, I think you're aware Singapore has sent supplies, medical supplies. We're working through the Myanmar Red Cross. And we'll also see whether there are other channels, other avenues in which we can deliver assistance effectively to our brothers and sisters in Myanmar.